Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Praise the Lord. I, um, when I was down there and Pastor Ryan was <clears throat> speaking at the end, I think it's important to, I had a person recently tell me, well, I accepted Christ, but I haven't changed. I'm still angry, I'm still depressed, I'm still all of this. Well, you know, I thought the Bible said that, you know, when Christ is in you, all things will pass away. Old things will pass away, behold, all things become new. And it's interesting because I was able to kind of set her free. Most of the times, the deliverance that we're gonna have is progressive. It's Jesus working in our hearts and minds. You see, we're a believer in spirit, but our soul still suffers. Still, you have things that have been stained by the world and by relationships. And so I believe that, according to Psalm 34, that he is close to the brokenhearted. And in Isaiah 61, he wants to bind up broken hearts. Sometimes God can do that instantly, but a lot of times he does it progressively. And he does it in relationship. So I just wanted to help you because if, if you have accepted Christ and all of a sudden you've got these weird thoughts and all of a sudden you know, it's like, I thought I was a Christian. Paul said the same thing in Romans 7. I do the things I do not want to do and the things I want to do I can't seem to do. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. So he called himself a wretched man and he wrote a third of the New Testament. But you know what else he said afterwards? He said in Romans 8, 1, therefore... There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Amen. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So that means that you're going to live your life and Jesus is going to transform you little at a time. I, I love this statement because I preached it before. It is not about the destination, it's about the journey. God will get us to the destination of healing. He will get us to the destination of eternal life. But we have to grow in the healing, in, in the journey between now and then. Amen? Amen. Okay, that was my sub-sermon. So that wasn't what I was going to talk about. Well, I, 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 um, I appreciate Pastor Ryan giving me a little bit of time to look at Acts 5. It's one of my favorite stories exists here. Um, in the Acts series, you all know and have been conditioned here to, to, uh, to learn that Acts is basically the story of the early church. They had just come out of the experience of Jesus' life and then his death and resurrection. And now God's like, I want you to go tell the world what happened. And so this is the story of them. Now, here's the interesting thing. How many of you have tried to tell the story of Jesus and had opposition? whether it be from human beings or in your own mind. And so there is opposition and there was opposition in Jesus' life. Unfortunately, it was the church. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests had a problem with what he was doing. For some reason, they had one idea of religion, but Jesus was going to blow that out of the water. Because his was all about relationship. His was all about getting to know him. He did not want anyone to worship just with your lips, but worshiping with your heart. And so there's going to be opposition. You're going to have spiritual opposition trying to uh, live a life of Jesus. So I want to pick it up in Acts chapter 5, and it'll be on your screen, verses 17 to 42. Very interesting story. But it starts out with opposition. So, you know, God is doing all this wonderful stuff through Peter and John, and, and they kind of knew this wasn't going to be easy. Because it says in verse 17, then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles, put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, and I want you to go house to house and just silently spread the word, all right? Don't bother the people. Make sure that you do this just quietly. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what it says, isn't it? 
It says, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. So they let him out of jail to go back to preaching about Jesus. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, see, they hadn't know yet that these people were preaching, you know? I don't know why they didn't have any social media or anything like that, you know? Hey, did you, could you, look, somebody's out there in the temple courts preaching Jesus. I thought you put him in jail. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, right? Doesn't God, isn't God good? Because he can hide things from the enemy, too. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss. (laughs) Like, duh, when God does something, you're not going to figure this one out. Wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that time, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Duh, you are. (laughs) Listen to Peter and and the other apostles. They replied this, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand and as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. That is God's sole purpose. Verse 32, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. This is very interesting because look at how he addressed them. Men of Israel. These are the people that God came to deliver. And they're rejecting him. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, he's a really good lawyer here, Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. That's why I'm I'm entitling this message, God will not be stopped. He's not going to be stopped. Verse 40, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Look at verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They did not stop. When we look at this story, the more the word gets out about Jesus, the more opposition it would have in this particular story. 
And isn't that like what is happening in our world today? The more we try to preach Jesus, the more Jesus is coming out, the more his light shines, the more the darkness tries to come against it. Mankind tried to stop the spread of Jesus at this time, but God would have nothing to do with it. No orders or threats from man will stop it. Peter's response was, we must obey God rather than man. And what if we say to us, ourselves, we are not going to obey man, we're going to obey God. But the fear of the threats and what happened to them did not for one second diminish their passion of what they had seen from Jesus. But the confusion of the Sanhedrin was overshadowed, and I love this point of the scripture, was overshadowed by the advice of an esteemed Pharisee, a teacher of the law, Gamaliel, because he said anything of human origin is going to fail, but if it is of God, it will not fail. And so it says to us today, what do we put our trust in? Do we put our trust in our own flesh, our own ideas, our own understanding, or we put our trust in a God that transcends our understanding and he can do anything in our lives and he does the impossible for us? That's Jesus. That's who we serve. That's who they served. Do you know that God is God of the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is not changed. He is not going to be put in a box. You need to take him, put him into your life, experience his presence, experience his deliverance, and it will never stop. When you do it in the Lord, it never stops. When you do it in your own power, it goes away. Anybody, do, anybody have any New Year's resolutions that are still alive? Because <laughs> we're doing it in our own power, right? There are four takeaways I just want to briefly talk about here. Number one, God's word and work will never be silenced. You see that in this story. God's purpose is to redeem every single person on the face of the earth. He does not, in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, somewhere in Peter, it says <laughs> that God is not slow in keeping his promises. He does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's the word that will never be silenced. It is his work to redeem mankind, and he will not stop. He is going to make sure everybody has an accounting for what they need to do with Jesus in your life. And my prayer is that every single person in this world would accept him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. 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 Jesus, will, this will, he will get the word out. God is going to get the word out through his work in this world, his word, and our testimony. It is our testimony that people are going to hear. How are they going to come unless we tell them? This is what the apostles did. They weren't ashamed. They were passionate about what they were doing. And we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel either. But you have to look at what it is that God is doing in your life and you need to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Isn't that neat? But listen, there is a spiritual battle. There always has been a spiritual battle. Ever since Adam and Eve was in the garden, here comes a serpent and turned Eve and Adam against God. From that day, when you look at all the Bible and in our own lives today, there is a spiritual battle that is here. And so I got to tell you something. Evil is coming against this world. Darkness is coming against us. The enemy is going to work in our minds. He'll work in our emotions. He'll work in our lives. He'll work in our marriages. He'll work on our kids. He'll work on all of our habits. He'll work on everything to try to get us away from God. But it is God's word that will never be silenced in your life. If you live by Jesus, he will not fail you. So those experiencing his love and works in their lives will develop a passion for him. But those not aligned with God will always attempt to stop that message. It's polarized in this world today. But the good news is this, that God's word and plan is always going to be stronger and bigger than anyone trying to silence it. It is bigger. Amen? Amen. All right, takeaway number two. Experiencing something increases our passion for it. When you, when you experience something, you are automatically getting excited about it. Wow, man, I went on a cruise. You should be with you there with them. It was a really fascinating thing. 
and you want to tell everybody. I bought a new car. I experienced this. I'm passionate about white Hondas because we bought one. You should see it. We become passionate when we experience something, don't we? But look at Jesus. Look at Peter and the apostles. In verse 32, it says, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. In Acts 4.20, just the, the chapter before, Peter and John are saying this to the Sanhedrin, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We cannot help speaking. So if you can experience Christ in your life and you bring him in to a better walk with him and you're continuing to progressively grow in him, he, it will get exciting to you. There is a passion that develops there. This is true. Let me ask you this. The greater the experience, the greater the passion. The greater the passion, the more motivated we are to share it with others. Isn't that something? So to to experience something gives more power to our testimony. When you experience Christ, it gives more power to your testimony. Pastor Ryan, a a couple weeks ago, I don't know if it was last week or a couple weeks ago, was expressing his desire for Calvary to be like this church. That they would be a passionate church. And that's kind of my words too. And so I, I would, I, it really intrigued me. And, and, and then two things came to me when I was sitting there about how we can be a more, a more uh, passionate church for Christ. And the first one is this, that we need regular encounters with Christ. We can't be energized. We can't be passionate about Christ if we don't have the experience of him. You see, the early church had a direct experience with Christ. He walked with them. Their passion was great. They did not stop. And so I would say to us today that our passion for Christ is directly tied to our experience with him. Your passion for spreading the news of Jesus Christ is directly tied to your experience. And so what does that mean? That means we have to increase the experience of Christ in our lives. We have to walk with him every day. But let me just say this. Would it be true then that if we don't regular, have regular experiences with him, we can lose an element of excitement or passion? So we can be empty. We can become legalistic. We can become just like the Pharisees where Jesus said, you worship me with your lips as your heart is far from me. Here you go up to somebody. Do you know Jesus? I think he's, I think he loves you. I'm not quite sure because I don't know if I've experienced it or not. But what if you have that experience and it empowers you to spread the news about Jesus and it spreads because what happens is your passion ignites someone else through the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do it on your own. Our regular experiences with him will ignite a passion that will ignite someone else's passion and the Holy Spirit can save them. Amen. Amen. We need to have that regular experience. So you, the question is, well, how do I do that? Well, let me tell you how. Can I tell you how? Yes. Everything that we've been talking about from this, this church for the last 40 some years is just getting into his word. Yes. It's, it's praying, having regular encounters with Jesus. It is fellowshipping with God's people. This is a great opportunity right here. We're growing in the Lord because we're in the fellowship of his people and we need that strength to continue to grow. We need to commune with him. We need to serve others and allow his gifts for you from, that he gave you to operate. But more than ever, we need to have a conscious awareness of God that is in you and around you all the time. Amen. I am amazed every time I go outside at night and I look up into the sky, you know what ignites me is the passion of a God that created all those stars and put the universe in order. When I see a rainbow or a cloud pattern or something, consciously be aware of what God is doing in your life because he wants to reveal his beauty to you. That's his love. His love. And you will see it. In Psalm 103, there's a verse in there that says that as high as the heavens are above the earth, 
How many can stretch your arms like that? As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So he's trying to communicate his love and he's opening us up. Have a regular experience because when you do, it just excites you. So we need to have regular experience of God. The second thing, though, is a little bit difficult, too. We need to have a healthy fear of God. Okay? God is who he is. Now, this does not mean that we are to be afraid of God. This is not human fear. Because I know a lot of people that have human fear and it causes you to pull back from God. It, may, it scares you about God. But this is not what it is. It is an awe-inspiring view of God and what he does for us. It is marveling at the enormity of his love and his compassion and his majesty. It helps us to have a passion for him as our creator and a healthy view of him helps us to be a witness for him. It will increase our passion, wouldn't it? But it also does one other thing. It helps us to live a holy life. It keeps us from actively sinning. <laughs> I love thunderstorms. How many of you love thunderstorms? I would... If I wasn't here today, I'd be a meteorologist. That's not a secret. <laughs> because I love nature. I love the weather. I love how God has set in motion everything. See, I'm always conscious of God. But I'm going to tell you something. I'll go out on the porch and I'll watch a storm come and it was, it's majestic. But when it gets really close and the lightning and the thunder is really loud, <laughs> I'm not thinking about sinning at that moment. So the healthy fear, there'd be an awe-inspired moment where we understand that God is watching our every move. And I don't want to be afraid of him, but in awe of him and in passion and in experience of him, I'm not going to sin. I'm going to endeavor to live a life that is, that is in him with everything. I love this story in Exodus 20. How many of you know Charlton Heston in, in the Ten Commandments? Okay. <laughs> His name was Moses, right? So he's on the mountain. I don't want to date myself here. Some of you may not even know what that is. But God came to give the law, and he was on the mountain, and he gave the Ten Commandments, and something was happening to the people on the ground. And here is what it is. The narrative in Exodus 20, it says, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. How many of us would do that? We're going, oh, no. Something's happening. I got to get out of here. I got to get an umbrella, get a shelter, do whatever you got to do. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. That is human fear. That is human fear. Let me show you respect fear though. Because Moses said to the people, do not be afraid God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. That's like, wow. Do you realize what God is trying to say? It's like when you have a healthy fear of the Lord, you don't want to sin. You will try everything that you can to avoid that. Now, we're not going to avoid it because we do sin. In 1 John, it says, if we say we're without sin, we lie and deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you know that God is that much in his love? Is that when we come to him to confess one sin, he says, I'm not done yet. I want to take my soap and I want to cleanse you from everything that you've ever experienced in your life at that moment. So in other words, when we come before him and agree that what we've done is wrong and bad, he says, I will take care of it all. You don't even have to confess it. I'm going to make you new. That's what it's like to experience God to be in his presence and to feel that cleansing power of the Lord. And that is experiencing Christ, which increases our passion, which helps us to go and spread the news. Amen? Amen. Amen. If, you're, if you're sitting here listening to Pastor Ryan, you need to go disciple somebody. You need to spread the word. We need to witness to the lost. And you're just like, okay, I'll do it. All right. But you don't ever experience Christ. It won't be passionate. It'll be legalistic and dead. 
But if you experience Christ, bring yourself in. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's available to everyone in this room. That same passion is available to you all. We have to remove the veil from our own lives, don't we? So we know what a healthy fear of God has developed and regular experiences of him. Okay, two more takeaways. Takeaway number three. God is always transcending the natural by overcoming the impossible. He always is transcending the natural. What we understand and the impossible that we think he will overcome. Verse 19 says, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And notice what happened is that they didn't come back to the jail and they didn't see the doors were busted open, the guards were dead and the earth had shaken and the jail was just cockeyed and all of this stuff. No, he brought them out without the guards even knowing. Can God do the impossible? He brought them out, even to the point where it says we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. That's a mystery. Do you know why? Because it's a miracle. We're not going to understand it, but we take it by faith because God is a miracle worker. Amen? Amen? But isn't God above all? He can do anything. He can do anything that that will be beyond our comprehension or understanding because it is God being God and loving us because he cares about us. He can transcend anything in your life. I'm going to tell you something. If you're in a prison with anything in your life right now, I don't care if it's an addiction, an attitude, depression, anxiety, relationship difficulties, and you're in a prison and you're, you're encapsulated in this box, I'm telling you that God will set you free. He can bring you out of anything any situation that's Jesus and what is exciting to me is to see people change and they're excited about Jesus and they're going out and they're saying come and see a man that told me everything I ever did as the Samaritan woman at the well said she was passionate Think of all that he has done in the Bible. Man, there were so many miracles. From the parting of the Red Sea to rescue his people and bringing them to the land he was giving them, to Jesus' life and miracles in order to give us eternal life, to everything big and small that he does for us today. It's a miracle. You see, he does the impossible so that a relationship with us and his provision is possible. He did the impossible. He cleared the way for relationship. Remember, he tore the veil in two. We need to bring down our barriers. Amen. Amen. I need to say something here too. A lot of us try to dictate what miracles God is going to do. Okay. And, and I see people get discouraged because, well, God hasn't answered my prayer. Well, I prayed and he hasn't answered it. And every time somebody says that, I kind of say one word at the end of it, yet. Because the problem with humankind is that we lack perseverance and we lack resilience. And and, and if you are sitting there saying, well, God hasn't done anything for me, I am not one of these people that can be passionate for him because I'm not experiencing Christ, then we have to look in the mirror and say, what may be the problem? Can I say that? I can't blame God for what my deficiencies are with my relationship with him. I have to look within my heart and say, what's blocking me? And so if we want Christ in our lives and we want him to do a miracle, we want him to do his will, not necessarily what we want. Okay? That's important. Because if we put God in a box and we say, this is the way I wanted God to do it, but he didn't do it, now I'm discouraged, that's not cool. That's not cool. That's not passionate. You're not going to be passionate. So I'm passionate. You know what I'm passionate for? The will of God in my life. And if it's difficult, I want to go through it because it's Jesus. Amen? Amen. Last takeaway before we have to eat dinner (laughs) tonight. Takeaway number four. This is a really interesting takeaway that that I saw. Opposition, adversity, and persecution helps to strengthen our passion. There's something about this. 
You know, if it's a worldly thing, if it's a human thing and opposition comes against us, we just walk away from it, right? If you don't have passion, you walk away from something. But there's something about the spiritual nature of the gospel, the spreading of the, of the good news of Jesus. And when we come against opposition, something in us just gets stubborn. And that's the one thing we should be stubborn about. Not about our own will, but the God's will wanting to be stubborn when the enemy comes against us and tells us to be silent. But when you're spreading the gospel, it increases the passion. Look at verse 41 and 42 of this text that we're talking about. It says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They didn't let opposition take. In fact, what is their attitude? They walked away excited. I couldn't imagine. Can you imagine them being in, in before the Sanhedrin and just kind of laughing inside, you know? And it was like, okay, what are you going to do now? Huh? Because what's, what's in me is stronger than anything you can throw at me. Because my God is bigger than your circumstance and your belief. My God is bigger than what the world has to offer today. I'm excited about that. So when you're living Jesus, you're going to have opposition. Maybe not from human to human, but you'll have it in your head. You'll have it in your emotions. You'll have it in your will. There'll be something coming against you because the enemy is not going to like you growing in the Lord. And he will try everything that he can do to keep you away from that habit of growing in the Lord and in Jesus. <laughs> Amen. I love that. Hey, somebody has said this one time and they said... If you are not experiencing opposition, you may have to evaluate whether or not you're saved. I, I, I just, that was really neat quote. And it was like, wow, because when you have Christ in you, you've got an enemy. And I've always said that the Christian life is the most difficult life to live because the world is free with their own darkness. But when we accept Christ and light comes against us, as the Bible says, the spirit wars with the flesh and the flesh with the spirit so that we do not do what we want. So in other words, you can't do wrong because if you want to do wrong, the spirit's right there. If you want to do right, the flesh is right there. And you need to conquer it in the power and the name of Jesus Christ. That's all that's going to deliver us. Our passion plus persecution equals more strength, increased passion, and more devotion because it's a spiritual war. We need to make sure that our devotion and passion for Christ is rooted in the truth and strengthened by experience. Rooted in the, in the truth. What you believe is the truth and it's rooted in experience, then your passion's gonna increase and the opposition will too. But when we have opposition, folks, we can sit here today and say, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. He is greater. Amen. Let me tell you something. If it's grounded in self, if your passion is grounded in self in the absence of experience, it will disappear under adversity and persecution. Amen. Amen. So in conclusion, God's love for us and others will never be silenced. He is passionate about that. He's passionate about his message. Second, our experience of Christ increases our passion for him and the urgency to tell others about this. Increase the passion. Well, let me just say this. Increase the experience that increases the passion and it increases your testimony. And then you'll want to go and experience Christ. Third, God is the master of the impossible. Don't focus on the discouragement of the impossible, but focus on the God of the possible. If you are not experiencing Christ in some phase of your life, do not give up because he is still there and he may be teaching us something and he wants us to get stronger in him. Don't give up. He is the God of the impossible. Amen. What we think we want is different than what he wants to give us. Folks, hang on. Don't get discouraged. Amen. We need each other. We will experience persecution for what we believe, but know that our passion will increase as we hold on to God. And finally, just this to cover it all, don't do things on your own strength. Gain your strength by an all-powerful God. 
I would submit to you, do not even testify on your own strength. Don't testify. Don't try to witness if you don't have a passion for it because you'll find yourself getting discouraged because you know what the world will throw at you? Their own logic that will confuse you. So when you go and you spread the gospel and you spread the word about Jesus and your experience, you're coming from an experiential perspective. You don't have to argue it. It's not intellectual. It is spiritual. Do you know how I know that God worked in my life? Because I'm different than I was before. Every one of you that has the Lord can, can testify that before your life was this way, when you accepted Christ, it got better. And this is what he did for me. And you could share that with others. Amen? Let's stand together. God is powerful. Amen. He is loving. We want to experience him. Do you know why Pastor Ryan talks about a fast in prayer? Because he wants us to develop a relationship with him. You've heard him say this, and I just want to trumpet it because I think it's so important. His passion for the church in general, because we shared this on Tuesday, his passion for the church in general is we would become more like Christ and we would experience him more and more. That we would take down the barriers and that we would be a powerful, passionate church that would witness unbelievable miracles and manifestations of God. That's what God wants for us. But we're holding back. God wants us to let go. So the prayer team is coming down and we're just going to close. But I want to speak to two, two, two uh, specific people. And number one, if you have never experienced Jesus, this is really neat. If you've never had this experience that I'm talking about and you want to have that experience, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. All you have to do is say, Lord, remember me. Help me. Come into my life. I want, to, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin and I want to live for you. It is very simple because the Bible says that we are saved in our hearts. If we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus is raised from the dead, you should be saved. That's it. It's simple. You don't even need a long prayer. It is there. He sees your heart. He wants you. So after we pray, I want you to come down and, and talk to one of the prayer team because I want you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We want to help you to grow, by the way. That's the passion we have in our church. But to those of you who are having barriers and you want more of a relationship with Jesus, I want you to come down too and be prayed for. One of the most powerful scriptures, I think, is in James 5, where it says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And what that simply means is that we, we pray for each other. We confess our sins. Now, I was raised Catholic, so I know what confession is all about. <laughs> but the only thing I know is that a priest can't absolve you of your sin, but Jesus does. <laughs> you know? I, I, they, they practice that way and I've learned that way but what I've come to realize is that Jesus himself wants to cleanse us of our sin he forgives us by getting rid of it so if you need help with that our prayer team is here as well but let's go to the Lord in prayer today Lord we're just thankful thankful for your word Lord thank you for the excitement and passion of what you have done for us because we see that in the early church, that they had experienced you directly and their passion was great. But we need to work at bringing our passion into bear. We need to work at bringing our relationship with you stronger so that our passion would increase. And as our passion increases, we go out and tell others about what we've experienced. So I pray for each soul in this room, whether they have not accepted you, open their hearts by the power of your spirit to, to just be convicted, to come in 
and, and reside in them. And if we need as a church more help with our relationship, we need discipleship, we need to help one another, we need to do regular things in our daily lives to grow in you. So thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Pastor Ryan leading us in the right way, in your way, in what you want us to continue to be in the future. But we will face opposition. And as a church, we're going to stand because this building, our, us as a church, even if the building doesn't exist, our church, it will be alive till the end and beyond. So we thank you for your, your unbelievable love for us. Go with us throughout this day. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you need help, come down and pray. Have a good week.